The foundations of long-term prosperity are under attack. They are under attack by the nationalists and populists of the political right, by the progressives and the populists of the political left, by President Trump, by President Biden, by leaders like Senator Josh Hawley and Senator Elizabeth Warren. What do we mean by populism? Populism pits the people against the elites. Populism is characterized by pessimism about current economic conditions and prospects and by about future prospects. Populism is characterized by a turn inward, by building walls, by retreating from the world, by retreating from global economic and security leadership. Look no further than President Trump's inaugural address where he referred to mothers and children trapped in poverty, where he referred to rusted out factories scattered like tombstones across the landscape of our nation, where he referred to crime and gangs and drugs. Look no further than Senator Sanders, who argues that the American dream has become a nightmare with workers working longer, but living standards falling. These diagnoses get things right. Both political parties need to be more focused on typical workers and typical families than they have been. The United States has real economic problems. The United States has real social problems. The United States has real political problems. Champions of free enterprise often do focus too much on material consumption and often do focus too little on other aspects of a good life. But those are not reasons to abandon a commitment to free markets, free people, economic opportunity, and personal responsibility. Instead, the right response to America's problems is to try to expand the benefits of a market economy, not to indulge hostility to free markets and economic liberalism. Socialism, populism, and nationalism are attractive because they appeal to our moral intuitions around fairness. Defenders of free markets need to be able to appeal to moral intuitions around fairness as well. They need to be able to understand better and more holistically the role that markets play in our lives. The populist diagnosis is wrong. Empirically, the American dream is not dead. Morally, capitalism is not an inherently corrupting system. Diagnostically, key features of the populist grievance narrative are wrong. The populist policy agenda would set the country back. But the answer isn't laissez-faire libertarianism. Instead, public policy should use the benefits of free markets to expand economic opportunity. The American dream is not dead. What do we mean by the American dream? It means many things to many people, and its meaning has evolved over time. Common characteristics of the American dream include the freedom to choose how to live your own life, the ability to have a good life, including a good family, meaningful work, and a strong community. For many, homeownership has become part of the American dream. Across all these definitions, a common element is based on economic success and upward mobility. You can diagnose the health of the American dream with answers to simple questions. Are my kids going to be better off than I am? Am I doing better this year than I was last year? Does hard work pay off? Can a poor kid grow up to become a billionaire or to become president? The national conversation assumes that the American dream is dead. President Trump has said as much. Sadly, the American dream is dead, President Trump said in June of 2015. Marco Rubio, the senator from Florida, argues that the American dream was alive and well and propelled his family's story of upward mobility. He argues that the dream defined his family's history and argues that that dream has disappeared. Senator Elizabeth Warren argues that the rich get richer while everyone else falls behind. The game is rigged and the people who rigged it want it to stay that way. That's a remarkable statement. Senator Warren is arguing that the top 1% or the top one-tenth of 1% have kept their foot on the backs of workers and households and have harvested the economic gains from typical workers for their own enrichment. Arguments about the American dream often take an empirical character. Josh Hawley, the conservative populist senator from Missouri, has argued that 70% of workers haven't seen a real wage increase in 30 years. This pessimism is not confined to politicians. Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize winning economist, has argued that the American economy is failing its citizens. Ray Dalio, the billionaire investor, said in 2019 that the American dream is lost. Tucker Carlson, referring to the dark age we are living through, 
said that the American dream is dying. My goal is not to be Panglossian or contrarian. Americans have high expectations for economic outcomes, and that is good. The United States absolutely does face serious economic challenges. The United States also absolutely does face serious social challenges. We spend a lot of time talking about problems, and that's appropriate because our energy should be focused on solving problems for American workers and households. But it's important not to confuse pockets of problems and time periods of real struggle for the typical experience of workers and households. My goal is to zoom out from pockets of problems and time periods of real struggle, and instead to characterize the broader picture over the longer term. The broader picture is the more accurate reflection of the state of the country and of the health of the American dream.